a brief history of how the English Bible developed from the time of Tyndale onward might be told this way. Miles Coverdale had been a friend of Tyndale's from their time together at Cambridge. Making use of Tyndale's work, Coverdale finished the translation of the Old Testament and produced the Coverdale Bible in 1535. This was the first complete Bible with the Old and New Testaments to be printed in the English language. Tyndale was executed in 1536 and afterward one of his followers, a man named John Rogers, would publish a complete Bible under the pseudonym Thomas Matthews. The Matthews Bible of 1537 combined the work of Tyndale with that of Miles Coverdale. This was the first complete Bible to be printed in England. Before this, Tyndale's New Testament was printed in Germany and the Coverdale Bible in Switzerland. Both had to be smuggled illegally into the country. But after Tyndale's dying prayer, Thomas Cromwell compelled King Henry VIII to officially authorize an English Bible for the new Church of England. Cromwell then commissioned Miles Coverdale to revise his original translation. The result was the Great Bible of 1539. It was called the Great Bible because of its size, but is also known as the Cromwell Bible or the Cranmer Bible because of the preface written by Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. This was the Bible commanded to be put in all the churches of England, where it was then called the Chained Bible, since it was chained to the pulpit, as shown here. As a result of this authorized great Bible, the Word of God in English was openly and freely proclaimed to the people of England. Needless to say, the Catholic clergy were not pleased since England had not only cast off the authority of the Pope, but now all the people could read and hear the words of the true gospel, which from the days of Dominic and even before were always contrary to the papal teachings of Rome. But then, in 1547, King Henry VIII died, and his nine-year-old son, Prince Edward VI, took the throne. The new King Edward believed in the cause of the Reformers, and with the help of Archbishop Cranmer, England would become, for a time, a firmly Protestant nation. The new King Edward was seen as a Josiah figure who was to fully reform England from idolatry and popery. There is no question but that English Protestants saw their cause as a struggle between the Word of God and the deceptions of Rome. This painting shows the young Edward sitting on the throne with the Pope at his feet and the words idolatry, superstition, and all flesh is grass written about him, while above the Pope's head is an open book that reads, The word of the Lord endureth forever. A typical view is portrayed in this Protestant allegory, where the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are stoning a fallen Pope, as if crushing him with the word of God. At age 11, the young King Edward even wrote that the Pope was the true son of the devil, a bad man, an antichrist, an abominable tyrant. But the reign of the new king was short-lived, and within six years, he fell ill and died. Edward tried to preserve the Reformation by naming his Protestant cousin, Lady Jane Grey, to be his successor. 
but she would be known as the Nine Days Queen, because within such a short time, Edward's Catholic sister, Mary, would object and claim the throne. The would-be Queen Jane was put to death, and the reign of Bloody Mary took hold. Queen Mary's nefarious title would begin with her desire to deliver England back into the arms of Rome. Author Gary DeMar writes, determined to force the English people back to Roman Catholicism, she ordered the burning of all copies of the Bible in English. But not content with that, Mary would also burn those who were reading the Bibles, including some of the translators. The first martyr she burned at the stake was John Rogers, who had published the Matthews Bible. But he died in faith, and it was said that even his children assisted, comforting him in such a manner that it seemed as if he had been led to a wedding. Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had written the preface to the Great Bible, was also put to death. When his life was threatened by Mary, the elder Cranmer, out of fear, agreed to renounce his faith and write things in favor of Rome. But his conscience overtook him, and he recanted again and was sent to the stake. Before they burned him, Cranmer said, I have written many things untrue, and forasmuch as my hand hath offended in writing contrary to my heart, therefore my hand shall first be burned. And as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and antichrist with all his false doctrine. And so, thrusting his hand into the flames, Thomas Cranmer was burned at the stake, and with him many other Protestant believers during the days of Bloody Mary. John Dowling, in his History of Romanism, writes that According to the lowest calculations, 288 persons were burned alive by her order for the crime of heresy, and among them were the wealthy and the poor, the priest and the layman, the merchant and the farmer, the blind and the lame, the helpless female, and the newborn babe. With this outbreak of persecution, some 800 English scholars fled the country. Many of them found refuge in Geneva under the protection of John Calvin and the reformers of Switzerland. Among the English exiles were Miles Coverdale and the renowned Scottish reformer John Knox. At Geneva, they determined to produce yet another revision of the English Bible, this time one that would be based on the best manuscripts of the original Hebrew and Greek languages without the limitation of either the crown of England or Rome. Before his death, William Tyndale had produced a revision of his New Testament in 1534. At Geneva, they made use of this edition to produce the first part of the Geneva Bible in 1557. The following year, Queen Mary died, and her Protestant sister, Elizabeth, ascended to the throne. By 1560, a complete version of the Geneva Bible, Old Testament and New, was published and dedicated to the new Queen of England, Elizabeth I. The first Bible that uh, was translated completely from the Hebrew, the, uh, the Aramaic, and the Greek was the Geneva Bible of the Pilgrims. The Geneva translation is often called the Bible of the Pilgrims because it was this Bible that they brought with them to America when they landed at Plymouth in 1620. And they loved that Bible. The Geneva translation became the most popular and widely used English Bible that had ever been produced, with over 200 editions, from
from 1560 to 1644. It is also considered the first study Bible because it was filled with extensive footnotes from the leading Bible scholars of that era, including John Calvin, Theodore Beza, John Knox, Miles Coverdale, and other reformers of the time, with over 300,000 words of commentary on the Holy Scripture. It was like a Bible college education. There's all kinds of the reformers' notes packed into the Geneva Bible. The Geneva translation was the Bible used by John Bunyan, John Milton, Oliver Cromwell, William Shakespeare, and William Bradford. It was also the first complete Bible to divide up the scriptures into chapter and verse. Chapter divisions had been established in the 13th century by Stephen Langton, the Archbishop of Canterbury. While the verse divisions for the Old Testament were done by the Jewish rabbi Nathan in 1448. Meanwhile, it was Robert Stephanus, who was also at Geneva with the reformers, who at first employed verse divisions for his publication of the Greek New Testament in 1551. And so the translators of the Geneva Bible made use of all these methods, Old Testament and New, for a complete English Bible in 1560. It's the first Bible to have verse divisions. So the people love that because that was the first time there's a John 3.16. The Geneva translation would continue to dominate until it was replaced by the Bible destined to be called the best-selling book of all time, the King James Version of 1611. But this would only occur after the Geneva Bible was outlawed in England, with some even being arrested for owning it. It seems to have been forbidden because of the very footnotes that had made it so popular. Commentaries that represented the collective views of the reformers at the time, but were in direct opposition to the Church of Rome. Rome's ongoing persecution of Bible believers only convinced them that she was indeed the great whore of Revelation chapter 17. The woman that sits atop the scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. In the Geneva translation, we read, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and in her forehead was a name written, a mystery, that great Babylon, that mother of whoredoms and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great marvel. The scripture says the woman is a city that sits upon seven mountains or hills. The Geneva translators wrote, very children know what that seven-hilled city is, which is so much spoken of. That is the damnable harlot, the spiritual Babylon, which is Rome. In manner of deeds, she is red with blood and sheddeth it most licentiously, and therefore is colored with the blood of the saints. Meanwhile, their view of the Pope is shown in Revelation 11.7, which speaks of the beast that cometh out of the bottomless pit. The reformers wrote, That is the Pope that hath his power out of hell, and cometh thence. Needless to say, these teachings were offensive to Rome, but had been handed down for centuries. After the death of King James, his son Charles I took the throne. King Charles was a controversial monarch, accused by Protestants of popish and tyrannical actions, and was suspected of supporting an international papist conspiracy against the Protestant faith. It was during his reign that the Geneva Bible was outlawed. Could the footnotes concerning Rome have been the reason why?